gauge transformations or corrections. Which, so a gauge transformation is just a equivariant bundle map. that locally if you choose a trivialization um, you can think of this as a map from uh, you to the, from the open set to the structured group other but globally you need to consider a twisted version of a bundle whose fibers are the The reason I am repeating this is I wanted to make a small point. Is that if so? This is the uh, this is twisted by the conjugation action on the group. So if, if the group is abelian, then this is true globally. So so if G is abelian, then uh, globally we can think of G as just a map from the manifold to the group. So that makes life a little easy. And also the action of the, uh, the gauge group on the connection, that, uh, that formula also simplifies a little bit. So in, in, the, in the general case, we had this kind of a formula. back to the identity. So I can write this anywhere, it doesn't matter. But in, on something like the circle, if you just think of that as R mod uh, Z, then wherever you are, uh, it's all canonically identified. So, and G is also typically a, a torus. So uh, you can just think of that as Rn mod Z n. It's, uh, it, it's more, you can just think of these as ordered the differentials of ordinary functions then. Uh, okay, and we also talked about curvature last time. And the way we defined it was, if you have a connection on a vector bundle, Then, by a Leibniz rule, uh, uh, the nabla extends to higher forms. So we can repeatedly apply nabla. And if you apply it two times, you get a map from the space of sections. So the vector bundle is C. So you get this map, which is tensorial. So this map basically corresponds to multiplication by f lambda, which is a two form with values in e. So another way of saying this is if you have a, a section, then um, lambda square sigma will be just f a applied to sigma. Should that be omega square m e? 
Yes. Okay, and uh, let's try and uh, write down an explicit formula for the curvature. So, so of course I'll do this in local coordinates. Again, when I apply d plus a, let me just split it up first. So d square is zero. Note that uh, this you, you can think of this as a twisted derivative, t a. So this is also. So then there is a temptation to say that this d a square is. 0, but that is not the case. B a square is a tensor which multiplies by curvature. Um, okay, so B square is 0 and this is uh, B a tensor sigma minus B H B sigma plus a H B sigma plus I'll come to this term in a second. <coughs> These two cancel out. Now, what is uh, this term? So uh, these are both N D value forms. So you are applying the N D twice. So let's let's write that down a little carefully. So if I let me use uh, charts on U. So you think of U as sitting inside R N and uh, A can be written as A I the X I where A I is a matrix value function. So then this becomes uh, J applied to sigma dxi dxj right so then let me combine these uh, terms which are similar and then I get ai aj minus aj ai apply to sigma t x i t x i okay so this is uh, typically uh, people write it in two different ways sometimes you can just write it as a wedge a which feels very confusing uh, because it's a one form if you wedge it with itself it should be zero but it's not because it's a an end e valued one form as you can see, this this is not zero. Um, alternately, it is also written as uh, as a leap bracket, and the reason you have a half here is so just see this. If you stick into vectors, these two are vectors. Then uh, so both the wedge and the Lee bracket have a uh, tendency to double the terms. So, so you need to half it. So, so, you, so you 
it, you can write it either of these ways. If you put a leap bracket, you need to half it, that's all. And uh, the, putting the leap bracket is slightly more general because you're not, no longer thinking of your group elements as matrices. Okay, so your formula for the curvature is, is uh, dA plus half. Now there is also a way of viewing this uh, in principal bundles. A any questions before I? Um, shouldn't that be a bracket of a comma a rather than a which is? No, because a is a uh, one form. So when you put two a's together, you are wedging it. Then how can we take the Lie bracket of one thing? So this is what it is in the end. Uh, like if you write down, write it down in coordinates, you will get this. So this uh, it has this effect of producing the dxi wedge dx right? So that's that is the wedge going on there. So you are simultaneously taking wedge on the form and Lie bracket on the um, Lie algebra element. Connection is described by a connection one form. Connection one form. And we can take D of this. Because it is a so you cannot take D if uh, like for something like this you cannot just take a D. But this is a this is just a matrix Yeah. There's something like this. So you can just take the component wise. It's not a problem. Okay. So when you take DA, it uh, you can break it up into three parts. One, uh, the horizontal part, the vertical mixed part and the vertical part. So recall that we have a splitting of the tangent bundle of P. So, so if you have a tangent vector, you can split it up into horizontal and vertical. So this is the part which takes in both vertical vectors. This is the part which takes one horizontal, one vertical, and this is both horizontal. And it turns out that this is an exercise you should be able to do. This, this is 0. And this is, uh, rather I don't need to write the vertical. Let me just give it vertical inputs. How, what are vertical vectors? How do you think of vertical vectors? Kernel. Yes, but uh, excuse me. Lie algebra elements, yes. So if you <coughs> take two Lie algebra elements and apply it on P, and feed it into DA, then uh, it's a uh, not too difficult calculation. You, this is the answer you get, which you can also think of as except there is a problem. Sorry. The same logic as the previous time. We write it really. Uh, you should. 
probably put it here. Z p eta p both side means minus half bracket a h a applied on the pair of vectors. Yes, you're right. Um, yeah. So maybe I can write it this way instead. No, we Note that this this thing uh, vanishes on the horizontal part. Huh? So just plug it in and see. Yeah, if you plug it in, you will get uh, a C C A beta P half of everything. Uh, so. Uh, okay. And you won't see a half because the wedging will double it. So then you take half. So and this is. I mean that multiplication is actually a bracket. A is a is i p a eta p is actually a bracket. You're subtracting opposite brackets and halving so you just. Yeah. No, I mean. Okay. So here should I put a wedge? No. Bracket. I mean, a is i p takes values in the d algebra. Mm -hmm. So you are you can't multiply two elements in the d algebra. You are taking bracket. Yes, yes. But if I, if you think of them as, a, yeah. Yeah. try to figure it out on our own then maybe come back. Yeah, it's just as it's slightly confusing. It's not somewhat modulo this confusing thing which we need to work through. I think that's best done on your own. And this is this is exactly the so if you were to take local coordinates and replace a by small a you will exactly get curvature. So this is another way of uh, so if you if, the, if you descend it down to m or the other, other way of saying it is this is just the lift of the curvature. Okay, so and I'm uh, so this expression is going to be useful for my next result. A any any questions so far? Try and get a geometric idea of what kind of quantity the curvature is using the following result, except that uh, we focus on connections with curvature 0 to understand this method. So I define a connection is flat if Zero. 
and let's denote by a flat b the space of flat connections. And uh, is it gauge invariant? How does the gauge group act as on a uh, on the curvature? It just acts by conjugation, right? So if uh, your cur curvature is zero, then acting on a gauge group will continue to keep it zero. So the space is actually uh, GP invariant. Same as this, continuing to work on a principal bundle here. Um, if you have two horizontal vectors, vector fields maybe, such that they <coughs> are in the horizontal subpart. Or you can think of it as sections of uh, uh, sections on P landing in H. So if you have these two uh, horizontal vector fields, then the Lee bracket is also what circuit. flatness somehow so it's obviously let's uh, since both of these are horizontal this is just plugging in x and y into t right and uh, so there is a formula like this one form so <coughs> alpha is a one form so some of you may have seen this in your manifolds class but it's not it's not terribly hard to derive So yeah, let's apply that formula here because we know that x and y are horizontal, so A is going to vanish from those. So when you apply uh, x a y minus one to x minus a x y, so all of this is zero, and this is zero, this is zero, which means that the final term is zero. Which uh, proves that so, so this really means that the horizontal uh, horizontal field uh, is integrable, right? Yes, exactly. So that's the next observation. So this is exactly the condition in uh, Frobenius theorem. So. By Frobenius, the subbundle H is integrable.
which means that what that means for what the linear uh, what integrability means is that uh, through uh, any point I, for any point in P there exists a submanifold of dimension uh, same as the dimension of H. That is tangent H. Tangent to H at all points, not not just at a single point. So it's a local uh, thing we are looking at here. So if you have that a horizontal, uh, is there other people who have not seen Frobenius theorem before? Okay. So what uh, Frobenius? Uh, let me just pick the one. A vector field on any space, then you can you have integral flows for the vector field. So these are curves which are everywhere tangent to the given vector field. So you can think of the vector field as a one-dimensional subbundle uh, of the total tangent bundle. Right now, instead of a one-dimensional subbundle, if you so rank one subbundle. If you consider a rank two subbundle, can you get surfaces which are always tangent to the subbundle? So that's the question that is answered by Frobenius. Uh, it in dimension more than one, in general, we don't have such submanifolds. So if you take a rank k subbundle, it's not always the case that you will be able to find a k dimensional submanifold tangent to this subbundle. Uh, but you will be able to do it if you have <coughs> closure under E bracket. So if you take any two elements in the subbundle and you take E bracket, you should continue to be in a subbundle. If this condition is satisfied, Frobenius theorem tells you that you can find these kind of smaller dimensional manifolds. So in our case, uh, uh, H, the uh, dimension of H is the same as the dimension of the base manifold. So at any point we can, lo locally we can find uh, sub manifold. So essentially you can think of this as lifting the base manifold. So you can find or, or finding a, a section of the bundle P. So we, uh, essentially, locally, we are able to find sections which are always tangent to the horizontal subbundle. Does that make sense? So you can think of this as uh, locally, these are from a neighborhood of M. idea of lifts, horizontal lifts, right? So we call lift of the path on the 
interface by the port. So you can choose a starting point uh, on the fiber of comma zero, and you can lift this path. So, so the lift is a another is a path is another path landing in P such that firstly it's a lift. So gamma P has to lie in the fiber over P, and then the tangent to the curve has to lie in the horizontal support. So the, this this was the idea of horizontal lifts. So uh, so if you have a flat connection and you have these submanifolds through any point you want, then uh, near that point you automatically get these lifts. So the horizontal lifts have to lie on these submanifolds, right? So let me call this mark one. So, so note that lifts lie on the submanifolds of the mark one. So, uh, so earlier we had uh, we had this question in mind whether uh, if we deform the path is the holonomy function the same? And uh, the answer is yes. We have path in independence for for flat connections, and the uh, curvature uh, measures uh, how much. Uh, Path parallel transport depends on path. In fact, um, the, in the in in the in S one case, there is actually a formula. I might get this slightly wrong. Um, that if you have a path which is bounding a disk uh, sitting inside a manifold, starting and ending. So the polynomy of this path is is the exponential of the um, curvature integrated over t. Am I missing a pi? One, this is. Um, so when you think of F A as an I R value. Yes. So do I need to do one over two pi I? No, no, I. It's okay. No. Okay. So F A in this case is just uh, T A, where A is your connection matrix. So. So this guy is. A integrated over gamma, and recall that what was your uh, uh, ODE which gave you the lift? It was it was something like this, right? Rather, maybe it was this. Might be a science problem here. So this is the d term and this is the a term. So and we wanted to say that the uh, covariant derivative is zero. So so then uh, then you see this works out fine because log of gamma tilde derivative of that is. Minus a. So when you integrate a and exponentiate, you will get the difference. So which will be so first and also this is a Lie algebra element. You have to exponentiate it to get a group element. So roughly this is the proof for that. So whereas in the non-abelian case, I don't have an explicit formula like that, but it is still very much the case that uh, the curvature measures um, the failure of 
um, parallel transport to be path independent. Okay, so our, our conclusion here was that uh, so uh, so recall that we use this to define a polynomial function going from p gamma zero to p gamma one, which sends gamma tilde zero to gamma tilde one, right? So the remark is whole gamma is invariant under deformations of gamma. gamma to be a loop based at then I have a map from here to automorphism group at the fiber over M not right because if I'm on a loop, uh, these two fibers are going to be the same. So going around the loop and doing parallel transport uh, will give me a, a, an automorphism of the fiber. Uh, any questions? Clear. space then you can uh, by deformation of path you can uh, by, and doing holonomy you can just take any path because any path can be deformed to any path and uh, you you would end up at the same point but if two paths cannot are not related by deformation then there these maps will have different results so another way of seeing that is if you take a loop, which is possibly non-contractible, then going around that loop may give you non-trivial holonomy, although the connection is flat. Is, is this clear to everybody? Feel free to ask, because this is one of the few results we are proving. that this is a homomorphism, a group homomorphism. By the way, this guy can be identified to the structure group. And uh, the result is that uh, flat connections are completely classified by this holonomy. So let, let me call this um, so what this does is it sends a path to its polynomy of the path.
So um, the result is there is uh, a one one correspondence. Um, uh, flat connections modulo gauge to conjugacy classes of these homomorphisms. So, which can be you can think of this as uh, representations of pi one m conjugacy classes of representations. Note that uh, if you change the base point or if you change this identification, both of them have the effect of conjugating. So we can only look at this up to uh, conjugation. So in all our discussion here, we have proved one direction. So given a flat connection, we have produced a conjugacy class. Then it remains to show the other direction. Any idea? Yeah. Why was it D? Why was the huh? more of P M and D? Because uh, P is a so the is a map from a fiber of a principal bundle to itself, yeah. right? And it is a, a G equivariant under the right multiplication. So that means it corresponds to. Uh, multiplying so if you choose a trivialization okay so if you identify this fiber to g then any automorphism is equivalent to multiplying it by something on the right so on the left okay. this is sim something similar to what we did when we did transition functions so we you can uh, think of this element as an element in g but up to how this guy is identified. Okay, so the proof for this is given a, a, con, uh, a representation how to construct a, a, but a bundle. So we have to con construct two things here. We have to con construct a bundle and we have to construct a connection. So, uh, so the way it goes is Given so, uh, yeah. the left hand side appears to be uh, having a fixed principal bundle, that's not quite correct. Yes. I mean, uh, yes. We have to take uh, isomorphism oh. classes of principal All G bundles with flat connections on this. Yeah. So it's not for a fixed P. Yes, so that's a, an important point to note that on the left hand side we are also allowing the principal bundle itself to be so or topologically it can be different. So so now when we go to the other side, given a, a representation, we have to determine both the bundle and the connection on it up to gauge equivalence. And it's it's an easy proof. What you do is you just go to the universal cover. Form the associate. Yes. So go to universal cover. Uh, okay, I, I think I should have made this remark earlier. Uh, this is actually quite an important remark. I forgot to say. Um, locally, Flat connection is gauge equivalent to a trivial connection. This is quite important. And that should be clear from this 
Frobenius result because if you take a small open set, these submanifolds give you the horizontal planes. So that that is the trivialization. And if you use that trivialization under that trivialization, uh, the, it's just a trivial connection. Is this uh, is this clear to everyone? Uh, I repeat myself. So when you say a trivial connection, this scene is like this. You have u cross g, and the connection is just a trivial connection, uh, which means that the uh, the horizontal sections have their g component constant. Okay, so. So if you have a flat connection, you take these uh, these horizontal submanifolds that you have produced, and say that those are my submanifolds which have the g constant. So that doing that is just applying a gauge transformation because at every point you are multiplying by a group element. So so therefore on a on a on a locally you can to a gauge transformation to make it a trivial connection. And not just that, the only thing that comes in your way is uh, is loops. So if you if there is no pi 1, if your space is simply connected, then uh, flat connections are actually just trivial connections. Can you No, I was not done yet. I, because, uh, I jumped over there. So, so if you have a universal cover, uh, yes, yes. So you take a so you take the trivial bundle here with trivial connection. And we have to mod this out by phi one. Okay. And we we'll, we will use this uh, row to mod it out. So on uh, x tilde g acts by sorry phi one x acts by gauge uh, tech transformations, and on g phi1 at x acts via rho. So using those two actions, if you mod out, uh, you'll end up with a bundle on, a principal bundle on x, which will have a flat connection and it, it basically satisfies it anyone. you want. So the, the, the important thing to remember is that it, uh, locally, since it's trivial, uh, if you somehow remove the pi one, you are going to get something trivial. But it's just that when you uh, I make these identifications to go from universal cover to x, you are doing it in a twisted way. So that's what this modding out by pi one will accomplish. So you just define your In some, in other, in another, in other words, as uh, they said, uh, it's an associated bundle. You see, it as an associated bundle. Yeah, so I mean, x, x tilde is a pi one bundle. X tilde is a pi one bundle. Exactly. So we are extending structure. Exactly. Yeah. So normally we put whatever you are modding out, you put it here. And phi one has acts on G through that representation. The same as this. Uh, found here 
so it's, it, this is very interesting because uh, uh, the space of connections is infinite dimensional and the space of flat connections is also infinite dimensional and space of gauge transformations is in, uh, infinite dimensional but somehow this particular quotient happens to be finite dimensional because uh, this other object is finite dimensional so we will uh, we will encounter this kind of uh, phenomenon again so typically we we will need to do, do two kinds of things one is mod out by gauge and the other is restrict by some partial differential equation so here our equation is uh, this So, so there is a D here and the, this and together with the modding out by gauge transformation you produce a finite dimensional manifold. Okay. What um, do you mean by conjugacy like the conjugacy classes of representation is finite dimensional? It is finite dimensional, right? Because this is a, a discrete pi one x is discrete. So it's just a matter of choosing some elements in G. So it's finite dimensional. Hey, your manifold M is compact on which you are looking at. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it's a finitely generated group. Yeah. So you fix those generators and modulo the representation. So it's a, a compact variety. Okay. So uh, the, the curvature turns out to encode a lot of topological information and I'll look at a few more. So this is an instance where the curvature con contains, so curvature uh, if it, uh, it for a, sorry, the connection kind of contains the topology of the bundle here. So, so that's so. So, so churn classes are another place where you see that curvature has a lot of topological information in it. So, I recall that a little bit because I also need to introduce you to higher churn classes. So, recall the first churn class. What was it? It was trace of curvature. So, uh, so this is a Dirac cohomology class. So, when you take trace of FA, so FA is a two form in MD. So ND is a matrix. If you take trace of that, you get an ordinary two form. And you take so that happens to be closed, which Gomsi pointed out in the case of the S1 bundle. But in general, you prove the closeness using uh, what's called the Bianchi identity. So this is a general identity which uh, curvature always satisfies, which is this. In uh, let me, uh, in just in case, uh, in local trivializations, this is what it is. follows from the Bianchi identity. Why? Uh, because um, if you apply trace here, and this is a early bracket, so it doesn't have trace. So therefore, um, this is actually placed. And it's a cohomology representative and it's a first choice. Okay. And uh, you can do 
juntas. If you take this determinant, you get and expand, you end up getting all the churn classes. And the kf churn class is an element of the 2k <coughs> cohomology class. Strictly speaking, these churn classes lie in the integral cohomology class. So I'm just looking at the image on the real cohomology uh, real cohomology. But uh, let's stick to that now. And here also you can prove that uh, these forms are closed using the Bianchi identity, except the algebra gets much more complicated. So if you want to, to use just the reference for this, there's a book called uh, Riemannian Geometry and Geometric Analysis. So that's where I look at the proof, but I'm sure it's there in many places. Okay. So, um, what uh, is of interest to us is the second churn class. And using this and doing some algebra, you can get an expression for the second churn class as So, by the way, when you are doing determinant, you are multiplying forms and you are actually taking wedge. So, in this, so this is the expression for the second churn class. And just to get a sense of a very simple case. So if you con consider um, an SU2 bundle over S3, over S4, so firstly note that um, Did you say anything about its first chunk class? Uh, so what is the first chunk class? The first chunk class is taking the trace of curvature. And curvature in this case lies algebra of SU. And what is the Lie algebra of SU? Yeah. It's traceless, right? It's uh, it is Q commission and trace is zero. Basically the S here, the determinant equals one condition on the Lie algebra becomes Trace equals zero. Uh, you can say uh, slightly differently. Yeah. Uh, first term class you can compute by taking the top exterior also of yes. the vector bundle. Right. And since its transition functions are in SU2, uh -huh. in particular in SL2, uh -huh. I mean the top exterior power will have transition function one. So top exterior power is trivial. Yeah. I mean you can use this as a rank two HF vector bundle SU. with uh, I mean, transitions in SU2. Right. So its top exterior power will have transition functions as determinant of these transition functions, exactly. but that is identically one. How do you say it's identically? Oh, because it's, it's a determinant. Okay. okay. And so, okay. I mean, it's, it's a trivial one. Yes. H of a to S4. Huh? I mean, it lives in H of a to S4. Yes, that's, that's another way to no, say. But I mean, so huh? the base manifold is irrelevant. The here. base manifold is irrelevant here. So if, if you have a. Yes, so if you. 
mean, so the, the so second exterior power is trivial, so the churn class is zero. Exactly. So that that's another. And C1 uh, is zero. Yeah, that's another way of seeing it. But uh, let me not write that down to uh, add to everything. But uh, does anyone have? Uh, if you want, we can clarify this point. Yeah, but this is actually stronger. It's saying that the form itself is zero rather than that the class is zero. Okay. So this is, I mean, uh, what you're saying is more of a topological statement. Yeah. This is a point-wise statement. Yeah. It's, it's a stronger statement. Yeah, but in, in since we are in cohomology anyway, it doesn't matter. That's right. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm saying it's a, yeah as a form, it is identically zero. That's exactly. Not, that's a very strong statement. Yeah. Maybe not here. Yeah. So, uh, right. So we have uh, that if you have an SU2 bundle, so in general, if your your group is simply connected, your first short class is going to be. Okay. Because think about it. We saw, how did we see the there was another way of seeing the first chunk class. We saw in the P1 case, right? When we uh, attach a two cell, we got a map from S1 to the group. And if the group is simply connected, that map is going to be trivial. So then you won't get any first chunk class. Okay. So now, so this, uh, so the next invariant to look at in this case is the second churn class and uh, here in this case it's particularly easy to understand because uh, you take trivial bundles on uh, S4 minus a point and S4 minus another point so those two are R4s and when you the, and the intersection uh, de deformation retracts to S3 so the transition function Uh, deformation retracts to something from S3 to S3. So the degree of this map, if you have made all the right choices, is is exactly the second churn class. So how you saw the first churn class in S2, you can see the second churn class in the same way as in S4. So it's something which comes in when you attach a four cell. Riemannian metric, yes. A, a Riemannian metric will give you a volume form, but you do need a Riemannian metric. 
because volume form itself is weaker than Ramani. Because at any point you take an orthonormal frame which is oriented, so you need a Ramani must be plus oriented. So, so an oriented orthonormal frame you take and then if you have dx1 through uh, dxk, it just maps to the rest of it. So it looks something like this, you know, in a way, without adding any other things. Ah. If your partial Wait. x1s are the right kind of frame, yes. Okay, okay. I mean, so you mean that the x1 etc. is an autonomous? Autonomal oriented, yeah. Okay, at that point. At that point. So this is really a point by step. Ah. But just to kind of have it in your head. And oh, okay, so if you're feeling lost, then you just take m. In the Rn case, this is true everywhere. So if m is Rn and you have the standard Riemannian metric, then this is globally true. Yeah. So okay. maybe it's uh, what clarifying that you will not be able, not necessarily be able to get a global frame field. Yes. But that is not necessary for defining your hot star. Yeah, exactly. You need a global volume form mm -hmm. and a frame field locally. Exactly, yeah. So, you, yeah, you can take an orthonormal frame at a point. You cannot have orthonormal frame on a neighborhood. No, 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 no. You can have a frame, but you cannot have coordinates. You cannot have coordinates. Yeah. Right. So, let's specify what happens when you have dimension 4 and you get two dimensional forms and you get an isomorphism between two forms but this is not the identity uh, because, yeah, it's obvious it's not the identity. Um, so, then we can get a splitting into the self-adjoint and, sorry, self dual and anti-self dual uh, two forms which are defined as follows. So these are two forms on which if you apply the hot star, you get back the same thing. And the minus ones, same except that you get the minus. So if you are given any form, you can just, uh, for an arbitrary form, you can just write it like this. So this guy is going to be self-dual, this guy is going to be anti-self-dual. So any form can be split that way. So you have a splitting. And there are some easy observations to be made. So is it true that the signature of the star operator on global there is some complicated sign which I don't remember now. <coughs> but in this case it will be simple, but in general it's like involves n and k multiplied in a strange way. Oh yeah, minus one to the k and minus k. Right. So um, <coughs> so similarly what we are doing for forms we can also do for N E value forms, forms with a, which takes uh, the values in the bundle. So, omega two n values in P G can be written as omega plus. And the definitions are obvious because the hot star we are only applying to the form part. We are not even looking at what the bundle values are. Okay. So, well, before I move on, I, I'll prove like a few little results about this omega plus and omega minus. So, small one here is the following. So, if you have a form in omega plus and a form in omega minus, then the wedge is 0. 
and um, maybe since we are seeing all this for the first time, it's too good. Because it also, I get a chance to write down some general formulae. So let me just uh, move it on R4. But since it's a point-wise calculation, it doesn't matter. At any point, you can take a right frame. So so form can be written like this, right? So omega is in omega, sorry, omega is a self-dual form if, if it satisfies these relations. One, three, four, and one, four. Because if you have a dx1 and dx4, when you wedge, you'll get a dx2 and dx3. So that these two contributions should cancel out. And similarly, if you have a minus here, all these signs will become minus. So just by using these expressions, you can basically prove this result. So it follows. So what this tells you is that I have this FA wedge FA in my expression for the chunk class, right? If I split it into the FA plus and FA minus, there are no mixed terms in the wedge product. indices and these multiple dx size, right? So then when you take your product that is same as uh, taking some kind of dot product and integrating it with the volume form of the manifold coming from the Riemannian metric. So it's if you if you have taken your coordinates right, all this depends on of course taking the right orthonormal frame and all. But if, so in the simple case of Rn, for example, so if you're on Rn, this just boils down to the, some kind of a dot product followed by integration.
and uh, you can extend this metric to NE slash PG values, two forms. For that, you one need one additional uh, in uh, ingredient, and that ingredient is you need a metric on the Lie algebra. So you, for that, and you need to take a, a metric which is added invariant. Added invariant yes, and if you take a add invariant. In fact, if you don't mind, we can just fix it once and for all. In especially since we're in the case of a compact group. So if you take this to be your metric, then this is again some kind of a top product. Okay. So if you have a, a, a two matrices, uh, you just uh, take. Per, uh, corresponding entries and multiply them with one of them conjugated. So it's really just a version of a dot product if you write it out. So, um, but we uh, we have to make everything coordinate free. So, so if you throw this in into this formula, this gives you a, a metric on Because instead of just taking which, you will take the product on the G values. And since it's add invariant, it doesn't matter that you're on PG. Is you're confused? Um, if G is arbitrary, how can we take a trace of don't 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 worry about it. It's just let's let's focus on the compact case. In particular, we are SCP now. But in compact case, this is not an issue at all. Okay, so finally, I'm ready to define this Young Mills functional, which is the subject of the talk. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so we are doing, uh, uh, let me just write it. FK, which star FK, angle brackets, because those are the added variant metrics. And so it's literally the norm square of the curvature. So you have a metric on these PG val uh, value forms. So using that metric, you take the norm square of the curvature. So that is the young Mills function. And on R4, if you
Or you could or you could the bracket stay. Hmm? Oh, because uh, we have a G there, and ah, ah, okay. for we, so we apply the metric ah, of okay. the added variant metric on the G's. Okay. So you can also just write it, if you were to call this metric as a round bracket, then you can just say, let me put round bracket with a subscript of G to distinguish it from that round bracket. And actually since I've included the integral as part of that definition, I don't need an integral. Okay. Um, now, uh, this is not hard to check that the mod square of FA breaks down into mod square of this plus mod square of that. That follows from the fact that the mixed terms are don't contribute. So the contributions only come from the positives wedged together and the negatives wedged together. So this this breaks down in that in that way. And the other guy which we were dealing with trace of F A square. This is what appeared in the churn class term, right? Also be broken down into positive and negative. And here this this is it this involves a little bit of calculation. Sorry. This is a minus and that is a plus. And this step works only on um, uh, skewer joint, so UN or sorry, U2 or SU2. So so if U is skewer joint, you can check that if then trace of C square is uh, sorry. that fact and another fact I'm using is that if a form is so this is just a form okay if it's a self dual form then alpha wedge alpha is alpha <coughs> square volume form and if alpha is in negative, then alpha which alpha is minus alpha squared volume of n. So these are all very straightforward to check. So if you apply these uh, results, then you can show that uh, the trace of F A square splits as minus F A plus square and plus F A minus square. Okay, so 
so this is uh, this guy is 8 pi square times of the second chunk class. So if you're you're keeping the bundle same, you're varying your connection, this guy remains the same. And let's assume for now that your if your second churn class is positive, then the mac uh, I was hoping to get a uh, minimum of the young mills, but I'm get looks like I'm no, no, it's okay. Right, so if F A plus is zero, so I, let, let me make a small definition now. Uh, a connection is anti self dual. part is 0 and if you have the self dual part is 0 is that would correspond to a minimum of the young mills functional because this quantity or the difference between these two so note note that the, the churn class gives you the difference between fa minus square and fa plus square right so since that quantity is fixed your uh, young mills function is minimum when fa plus vanishes so and those are that uh, by we define those to be the anti self dual connections and those are minimum of the yeah those functional and when for a if a is an anti self dual connection firstly we have seen that it, it is a minimum of it is a minimum of young mills functional And secondly, uh, at the value of the Young Mills functional is just 8 pi square times the second chunk class. So it's 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 a topological invariant. So we will be. Uh, Looking at, uh, so I don't know how much we will be able to look at, but it's uh, these are the space of anti self dual connections modded out by gauge transformations. It's a very interesting space to look at, and it has yielded a lot of very powerful. So, um, and again, that has a similar kind of appearance to what we did with flat connections. It's a combination of modding out by gauge and a partial differential equation, which this is essentially a partial differential equation in the connection. So, and it, it, uh, so that will be a finite dimensional modular space with some singularities. So, uh, so I, I'll stop here for today.